Good morning. Good Good to see you all. Um, I always want us to be honest with each other, so I'll go first. I had a, uh, this isn't about communion cups or anything. I had a uh, really, really rough week with my multiple sclerosis. So there's, it's a, I've also learned, my wife says, Dale, you can't tell other people how to feel. So my, my temptation is, don't worry about me. She goes, if, if people want to worry, they can worry. You can worry about me, apparently. <laughs> but that's why there's a stool here in case I need it. I'm going to have a seat. I just didn't want you to, you know, unnecessarily create stories in your head like, he thinks he's really cool sitting on a stool. I really don't think I'm that cool at all. Ask my wife, she'll tell you that. You know, as people, we are storytellers. It could be verbally, it could be mentally, but we tell stories. We tell stories to ourselves, we tell stories to other people. We attempt to understand the lives of our neighbors, our families, our bosses, our church through stories. It brings meaning. Sometimes it's really, really helpful. Sometimes it is absolutely destructive. Early on in the Yelp years, you know, you give a response back to what you think about restaurants or places of business, whatever. Some of the restaurants were having a hard time engaging in the conversation because we all love the five-star Yelp, but when there became some kind of review that was really, really negative, they weren't sure how to engage in the conversation. And it frustrated them. But there was this pizza place in San Francisco that kind of did something that some would say, wow, that is incredibly crazy or confident. You see, they were getting some reviews that were great, but apparently if somebody had like a bad interaction with the maitre d', they just lit into them. So when you went to this place, they decided to make t-shirts out of not their best reviews, but T-shirts out of their worst reviews, the one-star ones. Instead of rejecting that part of the narrative, they promoted it. So, for example, if you went to this restaurant and ordered like a Neapolitan pizza with all the best, you know, whatever, or margarita, whatever you wanted to order, you may get it with a waiter delivering it to you with their T-shirt that says, this pizza was so greasy, I'm assuming this was in part due to the pig fat. Another t-shirt says, I am the worst waiter in the world. I may not even pay attention to you. (laughs) Their business started to grow because people just wanted to see what was on the t-shirts. Now, was this crazy or confident? For many of us, if not all of us, we want to be courageous and confident, don't we? We want to be these people that when we have moments of weakness that we overcome, But the paths we take often are fight against the very confidence we desire. You see, having just an idea is not good enough in itself. Not just being inspired doesn't make us courageous. You see, direction, not intention alone, determines our destination. For example, part of your story might be, I want to have a great God-centered relationship in the future. But if your direction says, so I'll date anybody that's cute, There's a counter to that. You may have in your heart, I want my kids to respect me. But if I mistreat everybody in public, it's not going to happen. If if your life story is, man, I want to lose weight, so supersize that. It's probably not going to happen. I want to have a great relationship with my spouse, so I'm going to prioritize everything over them. The direction or the intention itself doesn't lead you to a place you want to be. So how do we muster up this courage? How do we muster up this confidence? How do we muster up to take our aspirations into the actual destination it takes that we desire in our lives? We're in the midst of talking about renewal. Renewal for our lives, renewal for our hearts. Renewal in a very real sense is how do we get the kind of confidence and courage to bring us somewhere new? Because if you're like me, there are times we can be inspired by things. We see a movie and we're like, man, I want to be like that person. And we leave there and on the way to, the park, to our car, we already like get, you know, something happens. We drop our soda on the ground and it spills. I'm like, ah, oh, forget it. We so quickly give up. But where does courage come from? 
And as Chrissy just read, we're looking at this definition from Mark Sayers about renewal. The refreshment, release, and advancement that individuals, groups, churches, and cultures experience when they are aligned with God's presence. Not just the edicts, but the living presence of God. It's a resumption of our God-given purpose to partner with God fully, participating in his plan to flood the world with what? His presence. Today we're looking at a story from Acts chapter 3 and 4 because stories help us make sense of our lives. And at the pinnacle of this story, this verse says this in Acts 4.13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I pray we experience your presence today. I pray that the motivation, the enlightenment, the encouragement, your words would not leave us, would not be absence or void of walking forward with you. On this beautiful Mother's Day, I just pray that you will bless, that you will bless those who are rejoicing, you will bless those who are mourning. Help us to be new and refreshed today. In your name, amen. In his profound, profound book, The Spirit of the Disciplines, Dallas Willard wrote this. The general human failing is to want what is right and important, but at the same time, not to commit to the kind of life that will produce the action we know to be right in the condition we want to enjoy. We intend what is right, but we avoid the life that would make it reality. See, I think we'd all agree that a decision or the intention is just the beginning of something. The idea, no matter how pure, doesn't lead to us to new places in itself. A common equation we live in is this. An aspiration or a desired behavior plus our own willpower equals success. But there's a problem. But this approach, we take this approach to obviously sometimes achieving our desired body type. If I just have enough willpower, maintaining a sexual ethic or purity or aligning ourselves with God in those ways, or simply trying to be a good person. You see, relying on willpower alone pulls out exhaustion. We become exhausted because we're distracted by so many other things going on in this world that are pulling away from that very thing. We become tired. We become out so many things and we give up. It pulls out anger. Sometimes we just get really angry because other people aren't embracing the things that we're embracing. Like, why aren't you helping me be this when it's really just ourselves? And sometimes we feel shame, don't we? We just feel shame because we didn't, weren't able to do the thing we desired to do. And we get embarrassed. And others seem to be successful. Other moms seem to be handling this okay. Other people seem to be achieving what they want. And we tell ourselves a story that way. And shame arises out of our weakness. But let me propose something else to us this morning. The kind of enduring confidence or courage that actually helps comes from the empowering presence of Jesus in your life. You see, the presence of Jesus is not a destination. It's not a place to arrive, but it's a renewing path forward. If we tend to think, if I do X, Y, and Z, I might achieve the presence of Jesus, we are missing it all together. Because the presence of Jesus is something that comes alongside of you in this moment and walks with you forward into renewal. 
See, one of the early stories after Jesus' resurrection, and like I said a few weeks ago, whenever we're reading God's word, it's the story about God, the Bible, it's really important to ask ourselves, where am I in the story of God? We're gonna look at a story today that took place after Jesus died and rose again, after he had spent 40 days on earth with people, after the Holy Spirit came, after Pentecost. So Jesus is gone, the Holy Spirit has come. And Peter and John, his closest disciples, are now taking up the mantle. The story goes like this, starting in Acts 3, verse 1. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. Let me stop for a second. This is in direct um, relation to another story. When Jesus was alive, there was a story about how he was teaching in this house. And this group of friends had a friend who could not walk as well. But they were so committed and knew the destination to bring them to, or the place to bring them to, was to Jesus. So they brought their friend on a stretcher to Jesus. It was too crowded. They cut a hole in the roof, dropped their friend down because they know if our friend sees Jesus, there's a difference. In this story, the destination was different. We're going to bring you to a place where you can ask for money. You see, there's a big difference between bringing ourselves to a place of Jesus and to a place where we hope to just get whatever people can give us, whatever's left over. And sometimes that may not be much. Let's continue. When we see Peter and John about to enter, he asked, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, eye to eye, as did John. And Peter said, look at us. There's something powerful about eye to eye. They saw Jesus look at people eye to eye. They saw Jesus look at a man filled with so many demons, they called him legion, eye to eye. He looked at people who were blind and put mud on their eyes and healed them, eye to eye, face to face, so they did the same. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. I wish I could jump right now for you, but I will pass. But I look forward to next week, and if I can jump, I'm going to jump to look forward to that. It's quite a sight. There you go. When all the people, I'm just keeping it real, my friends. When all the people saw him walk, this is so great. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the man held on to Peter and John, even though he's walking and jumping, he's still hanging on to them because he's like, if I'm jumping, you're jumping. You know when a kid's like, hey, let's skip. That's what this guy is doing. I just think that's funny. (laughs) All the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? You see, the people in the temple, the people in the church, if you will, the people who were there to worship God, how did they see this man? They said, this is the beggar, right? This is the man who asked for money. That was their identity of this person. How did Peter and John see this man? God's about to do something good in you. They saw in this man what could become. What? A walker, a leaper, a praiser of God. 
Why does one religious group see this is the beggar and two people who had spent time with Jesus see this man as potential? Because they never forgot their story. Peter never forgot the, his story. John never forgot his story. Let's drop down to verse 15. Even though you killed the author of life, Peter goes on to say, God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. You see, Peter and John are telling the Jesus story. And they're telling their story within Jesus' story. You see, those listening had their own stories about Jesus. They had their own thoughts. And Peter proclaimed to them, you are the ones who killed this man. You see, stories about Jesus, like he came out of Nazareth, which in our terms, like he came from a nowhere town. How could anything good come out of there? It's a story they told themselves. The story they told themselves is he's doing things that I can't explain. So you know what they said about him? He must have the devil in him. And then they also said, do you see who he hangs out with? My goodness, he's hanging out with prostitutes, with gamblers, with tax collectors, with the people you don't hang out with. Why? Because Jesus doesn't see us as tax collectors and prostitutes. Jesus sees us as who we can become with him. He sees us as a path forward. A little later we read in Acts 4, the leaders came up to Peter and John while they were still speaking to the people, telling them the true story. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus and the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John because it was evening. They put them in jail till the next day. I love that. It's nighttime. Oh, we're going to take you to prison. But many who had heard the message believed. The story was changed. So the number of men who believed grew to be about 5,000. There was a lot of people who told untrue stories about Jesus, so just assumed they one had heard must be right. But when they heard the truth, something different you see, the truth also of this in key moments, when people are in need, you can only really give them what you have. So what do you have? What is it that you're giving to people? Is it passed on advice that you got from Twitter or Instagram? Is it something you once read? Or is it something alive and well? You see, that's how renewal spreads, is that God is doing something in one. And somebody asks you, what's happening? And you say, I'm not sure, but this is what Jesus is doing in my life. The issue isn't what we give people. The issue is, do we actually have something to give to people? Not as a place of shame, not as a place of obligation, but as a place of opportunity. So what are you giving to people? As I mentioned at the beginning, we are people that tell stories. Sometimes these stories are true. Sometimes we just create them in our head without real information. I want to show you something. Go ahead and just start this video. This video will change your life. In 1944, the psychologist Fritz Helder and Marianne Simmel conducted an experiment where they had people simply watch this video and say, tell me what you saw. If you're just listening to this message maybe later, what you'll see is two different size uh, triangles and a circle. There's a rectangle that kind of opens up a little bit like a door, and they're cruising around. Of all the people who watched this video, only one person, they say, saw it for what it is. Geometric shapes floating around a flat plane. Everybody else created a story. Some people said, the big triangle is a bully in trying to stop the small triangle from bringing the circle home. 
When I saw this, I thought, the big triangle is a big, angry, drunk dad and doesn't approve of her daughter's new boyfriend. <laughs> You're like, yeah, that's what it is. We see things and create storylines. Sometimes we think we're just being creative. But isn't that so true? Instead of seeing objects, we vividly see human lives and we try to create meaning. And the stories we create have amazing impact on our lives. We make up stories why people looked at us a certain way, why they did. We make up stories about our bosses, our coworkers, our neighbors, sometimes our pastors. Just to give you a heads up, I wear contacts, but I still can't see very far. One day I received a letter in the mail and it says, where do you get off judging me for the kind of food I buy? I'm not rich like pastors like you. And I'm like, I'm rich? Awesome. <laughs> they didn't sign this letter. So me being me, I went in front of the church this next week and I said, I got a letter this week that wasn't signed. I didn't say what was in it because apparently that's unkind even though I'm the one who was being yelled at in the letter, I said, if you know anything about this letter, please let me know. I'd really like to talk with the person. Turns out, I was at Costco. And apparently this person was buying one of those rotisserie chickens that are so yummy. I was about 50 feet away from them. They waved at me, but because of my inability to see far sometimes, and because I have waved at so many people back when they were not waving at me, <laughs> I did not wave back because I didn't know who they were. And I'm like, you're not going to fool me again. <laughs> they interpreted my lack of response as I was judging their choice of food. Six weeks passed and they got so angry at me, convinced that I was defending the chickens who were being raised improperly in the Costco cages out back that I would never, apparently this person didn't see the chickens in my own cart. We talked, we laughed, they left the church. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. They actually became one of my really good friends. And if you know me, I just don't let things go. So whenever we came over for dinner, guess what I brought? <laughs> Costco chicken. I tell that story because we create stories all the time. For some reason, there's something about just going to a person and say, hey, this is what I experienced. Can we talk about this? People make up stories about Jesus. They make up stories about faith. They make up stories about their experiences. And talking about Jesus, we often connect it to the behaviors of other Christians, of other people in the church, which is not a, that big of a jump why we would do that. But there's something really good about looking into the eyes of Jesus and hearing it real. You see, what if there was a story? What if there was a story about an event that brought meaning everything else that we do. Would you tell that story? Would you listen to that story? Back to Acts chapter 4. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers, and elders of the people. If we are being called to account today for an act of human kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man now stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone who builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. 
And when they saw the courage of Peter and John, and they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. Quickly, some observations that I make from this story. This is not a moment of this aggressive evangelism or manipulative storytelling. This was truth telling. This was, this is what happened. Here's the real score. This is why he's healed. God bless him. It is the truth that brings renewal. And renewal brings more truth. Secondly, this is a story of a predicament we can get into. It's a predicament of elites, educated, high power people. Nothing inherently wrong with education and elites and high power people. But they have placed themselves in a position where they were now looking down at God who actually sits above them. This is the story they were telling themselves. Peter speaks boldly. But Peter's boldness isn't a result of willpower. It's not a result of character refinement. It's not even just a result of his moral formation. It comes from the truth in a story. One he was in. One that has power. You see, Peter has not simply become a man who stares down the, his enemies with epic boldness, like we would see in a Marvel superhero, because there's no such thing as just individual boldness for followers of Jesus. There's no such thing as individual boldness for followers of Jesus. Willie James writes this, of course, each of us can and must be bold, but our boldness is always a together boldness, a joined boldness, a boldness born out of intimacy. The modern lie of individualism is most powerful when we tell ourselves the story that boldness comes from within ourselves, within our own willpower. It does not. It comes from an outside source. It comes from the Spirit of God. And that is what Jesus says will come into you. So renewal begins with a brokenness in the heart of one person. And it gains traction when it finds others who are open to the same kind of thing. The same open to aligning their hearts. And renewal is truth-telling. It starts by seeing things as they really are and then aligning those things with God's purposes as he moves forward. To help us land our morning, I'm gonna invite my mom to speak. Now, my mom passed away this past fall. So you're like, how are you gonna invite your mom to speak? This isn't like a weird trick, don't worry. My mom spoke here at Calvary Church to all the youth and their parents. In 1999, we found her talk that she gave that day. We gave it to people, and I read it, and I just want to preach with my mom today. This is what she shared at the end of her talk. There were probably 250 youth and parents that day. My mom's voice. The morning after I gave birth to my youngest, which was me, I woke up with a funny, numb feeling in my left leg. In the following weeks, whew. okay, mom, relax. In the following weeks, I was extremely fatigued, stumbled a lot, and the numbness increased. After six months, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. I was in shock. With six kids, including a new baby, what was I going to do? I never blamed God or asked, why me? 
It took a determined, positive approach to life and decided that MS was not going to control my life, but instead God would control my MS. I had no idea if I was going to be invalid or what my future would look like. I did ask God to let me live long enough to see my newborn baby turn 18. God more than answered that prayer. Actually, for my mom, she got to see all 14 of her grandkids become 22. So God's like, you prayed for Dale to be 18, I'm doing more. The doctors had said there was nothing they could do and that I needed to learn to live with it. I pushed myself too hard at the beginning and my family almost lost me. But God had a plan for my life and I had to learn to work on his time schedule and depend daily on him for my physical Strength, my faith and trust in him really grew. Psalm 30 became a real and uplifting to me. It says, I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up. I cried for thee for help, and thou didst help me. Thou hast kept me alive. Weeping may last for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. It was not easy raising six children with not being able to drive, run, or even walk for much distance, with extreme fatigue, problems with balance, and more. But my God provided so much help from my family, good friends, and willing people at church to keep us going. Much positive came out of that time in my life. My children learned to work together to make the family work. They had to do the majority of the housework and each one had to carry responsibilities beyond what most kids were asked to do back then. It was fun at three, cleaning the bathrooms, (laughs) just letting you know. I mean, it was my brother's assignment, but it it all got passed down to the youngest. They learned at an early age what it meant to be responsible and independent. They were committed to a family unit. But my husband and I did not raise our children alone. The Holy Spirit guided us. We used this power living within us to make the best of our situation. As John 16, 13 says, the spirit will guide you into all truth. There are many times I ask God, I do not know what to do. Can you handle this for me? Then the Holy Spirit would lead me in prayer for my children and enlighten my mind with ideas of how to handle different situations. You see, I made a choice so many years ago to not be bitter, but simply try to be better with God. Am I going to join God and make myself better for the experience, or am I just going to become bitter on my own? Psalm 30, verse 7 and 11 were an encouragement for many years. It says, Lord, by thy favor thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. Thou hast turned my mourning into dancing. You see, God turned my mourning into dancing. I had such joy in my life. So friends, whatever you're mourning today, whatever it is, let God turn it into dancing. If you need healing today, come to him in faith because he heals. And even if your body continues to hurt, she said, remember that it's your heart that needs healing most of all. So come to him. Respond to him. The greatest gift he ever gave me was being sick because I saw him clearer than I ever did before. You see, God can change your story. God wants to walk with you, journey with you, Align yourself with you. So as we do every week, I want us just to come before him. My hope is not for you to start the conversation with God on Wednesday or Thursday, but let's just take a moment and sit with God right now. I always invite people to close your eyes, if you will, maybe have your hands open as a place of just being open to him. And just start listening to God. Slow down your thoughts a little bit. Maybe just hear yourself breathe a little bit. What is God saying to you?
What story have you been telling yourself? What story have you been telling about other people that may not be true? Invite God into that story right now. There's a lot of us that feel like we're failing, we're falling short of maybe being a parent or mom or whatever our role in his life. God's like, don't tell yourself that story. It's not true. Let me tell you a new one. If you're in a situation like my mom says, and if you're unsure what to do, take a moment right now to say, God, I don't know what to do. Can you handle this for me? Hmm. Just ask him to join you. God, I just pray for your blessing on my friends and my family today. May they know that your presence is with them wherever they go. That your presence isn't something to be acquired, but it's something to experience and love and enjoy. So may we walk well with that. From Romans 8, 5, and 6, it says this. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. God bless you. You may experience life and peace today. And happy Mother's Day. God bless you.